going to share my screen um, uh, and just make sure that everyone can see that. Thank you, yes. All right, great. So I'm going to talk about uh, generative AI um, in the research process. Um, I, I think that there's a, a lot of interest and concern around this topic at the moment. Um, as I said, I've been um, looking at this quite uh, in quite a lot of detail over the last two years or so. Um, I have some opinions and positions that uh, may be controversial. Um, so I will share some of that today and, uh, you know, we can maybe include that in, in some of our discussion. Um, I, I'm also going to assume that everyone has, um, you know, a, a, a passing familiarity with generative AI, not that you've kind of spent an enormous amount of time with it, um, but that you at least are, you know, um, familiar with what I mean when I talk about generative AI or chat GPT. Um, if not, then, you know, throw some questions uh, into the chat. Um, I won't be able to see the chat, but, you know, somebody will be able to draw my attention to that. Um, I also like to start my uh, talks on generative AI with uh, with this slide. Um, and, and I really do believe that uh, using generative AI to cheat on essays and assessment tasks really is the least interesting thing we should be talking about right now. And I will touch on some of those uh, um, points throughout the, the talk. But if this is something that is a major concern of yours, then you know feel free to pick it up at the end and we can maybe have a, a bit of a chat about that as well. I think the main premise that I'm basing this on is that uh, most of the assessment tasks that we give students um, are based on their like a deficit model. We, we assume that there's something that they don't know and so we are doing a, an, a, a proxy because um, the assessment is a proxy of the real world. So we're giving them a proxy task and then trying to make predictions about, you know, where in the real world they're going to not be able to do the things that we care about. And I think that AI has just shifted that entire premise and we need to think very differently about what assessment looks like. So I'm just going to do a very, very brief overview of um, what I think of as kind of the state of the art, or, you know, where we are. Um, in terms of the first point, generative AI being a next word predictor, that hasn't changed. It still is a next word predictor, and that's all that generative AI does. Um, it takes the prompt that you give it, the context that you provide, and it just predicts the next word in the sentence. So all it's doing is just running constant uh, probabilities on what the chances of the next word in the sentence being X, and then it gives you that word. And it, just as a point of interest, this is one of the reasons why they're really bad at counting. Well, we think they're really bad at counting. Um, so if you ask it to give you a paragraph of 50 words or to reduce the amount of text in a paragraph by 50 words, it really struggles to do that because it's it's only able to ever see one word in advance. And so by the time it reaches the 40th word in that um, in that paragraph, it actually has no idea how many words are left um, before it finishes the sentence. So it can't plan how many words it needs to um, insert in order to hit the 50, because it can only ever see one word ahead. Generative AI is also multimodal. I don't know if you've seen any of the, the recent news. Um, on Monday, OpenAI released uh, a big announcement for an upgrade to the ChatGPT um, uh, service. So the GPT-4 language model that runs in the background um, is now fully multimodal, um, so it's able to see, hear, speak, generate video. Um, and then the next day, Google So language models are now almost completely multimodal, which means we can talk to them and interact with them um, in, in almost real time, just with natural language, without having to uh, type. Um, generative AI is increasing in competence, and there's two main areas where this is happening. The, the one is called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. Uh, RAG is quite a, um, a, a useful development that we've seen in the last few months. And what RAG it does is that it takes your prompt and it creates a search query from that prompt, goes to the internet, pulls down resources, and then uses those resources to inform the generated response that it gives you. So what this does is it grounds the model in reality. So it's, you're able to specify that it should only retrieve academic papers, for example. Um, and so it's able to provide citations that are accurate because it's drawing directly from those um, from those articles that it's pulled down. So you know some of the concern around hallucination and citation um, is is definitely on its way out. Those are not problems that we need to worry about anymore. Um, well, 
I'll, I'll caveat that in a couple of slides. Uh, we do still need to worry about it, but it is getting much less of a problem. And then plugins, APIs, and GPTs, I won't go into detail about what those things are, but they really allow us to connect foundation models to third-party services. And what I mean by that is that if we think of uh, GPT-4 or um, Claude 3 from Anthropic, those are foundation models. Those are the cutting edge, really big, really expensive models that all other things are based on. Um, and the third party services would be things like Wolfram Alpha, um, physics engines. Uh, so we, we look at something like ChatGPT and we say it's really bad at computation, mathematical computation. That also is becoming less true every day. But even so, we can use APIs to connect those foundation models to something like Wolfram Alpha. And now all of a sudden, ChatGPT is incredible at uh, mathematical and physical computation. Um, so th those kinds of uh, competence improvements are happening all the time. Um, and I think people who, who run small experiments with vanilla, what I think of as vanilla language models, the, the very, very basic things that you just get out of the box using what are known as naive prompts. So they're really, really simple and superficial prompts. Uh, you tend to get very simple responses back and people look at those responses and say, oh, well, there's nothing to see here. This is not really that interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about why that is not true. Um, generative AI is everywhere. And then I kind of caveat that by saying not yet, but soon. So it's already built into Windows 11. Um, it's already built into productivity software across the board. So you may not have seen this yet. Um, I don't know if your institution has signed up for um, the uh, $30 per user per month upgrade to Microsoft 365, where this is built into every single um, uh, product in Microsoft ecosystem. We've seen it in cars, phones. So essentially, this is intelligence on demand. And I know that there's a cost available, but um, even the GPT 3.5 uh, level models are, are really, really good um, for most people's use cases. And those have been free now for, for quite a while. Um, and kind of what I think of maybe as the biggest advance is these context windows that enable more accurate responses to more and more complex prompts. So the context window is every attachment that you upload to a language model and the entirety of the prompt and its response in an iterative back and forth conversation. So that context window is getting bigger and bigger. And I saw that the, the newer ones are going up to like 2 million tokens. So just for a little bit of context, um, all of the Harry Potter novels are less than 1 million tokens. So that means you can essentially, um, in the more cu cutting edge models, upload every single Harry Potter book and then have a conversation with the language model about the entire world that gets described in that book or in those series of books. So those big context windows are really allow us to give the models an enormous amount of um, context that we can use to inform our conversations with them. Um, it's surprising to me how many people still think that generative AI is the equivalent of search. Uh, so in search, uh, you put in a, um, a series of keywords and the search engine retrieves that information from a database and points you to a source. Um, in language models, the responses are generated one word at a time that use the prompt as a starting point. Um, this essentially means that language models have no ground truth. Um, there's nothing that they can refer to as the source for their information. Now, this is changing with things like a rag, which I talked about in the previous slide. But essentially, they've got no a priori model of the world. Um, and this makes it, in the beginning, it made it very difficult for us to know what was real. Um, people talk about language models hallucinating. Um, the reality is that every single response that they give us is an hallucination, according to the definition of that word in the computer science literature. Um, it just so happens that increasingly those hallucinations map onto our version of reality. So when the hallucination looks like something that we believe to be true, we say that it's true. When it doesn't, we say that it's hallucinating. But the reality is that every single response is made up from scratch, from the ground up, and therefore is an hallucination. Uh, data provenance uh, has until recently been a very difficult problem because of this reason, because the language models don't refer back to a ground truth. They don't refer back to a source. Um, uh, it made it difficult to um, uh, for them to cite sources because they, they literally had no sources. They were making it up. Um, again, this is changing now. Um, it's becoming less and less of a problem. But even though there were these problems, um, 
uh, LLMs are nonetheless really, really good at limited forms of world building. Um, and what I mean by that is that the context that we provide them creates a boundary that they can use to kind of delimit the responses that they give us. Um, and the more context we give them, the more complex those responses um, turn out to be. Uh, so this prompting uh, is really important. Um, it's not the equivalent of search. Um, we've become accustomed to uh, breaking our search queries down into a series of keywords, and then the search engine uses those keywords to find sources. But um, in uh, generative AI, prompting is actually establishing the boundaries of the world within the, which the model thinks. So we actually have to provide more context. Search engines taught us to take complex queries, break them down into very, very simple constructs, and then use those simplified versions. We'd reduce the complexity um, in order to get the responses that we want. With generative AI, it works the other way around. We have to provide complex queries to search to uh, generative AI in order for them to give us uh, what we're looking for. And that contextual richness is a really important indicator of the quality of the response. More context means higher quality output. Um, I think I've got a slide a little bit later about our responsibility then in um, getting weak responses. I've mentioned the fact that this contextual awareness is always increasing. And one of the simplest heuristics that you can use when you are using language models is this role goal instruct model. Uh, you say you are and you give it a persona, you say I am, that helps to uh, establish what you need, um, and then you say, I want you to. Um, and that kind of framework, you'll see all sorts of prompting frameworks, and you know everyone is you know, trying to position themselves as some kind of prompt engineering expert. The reality is that the prompt is less important than your ability to keep an ongoing iterative uh, interaction with the language model. So that initial prompt does establish the boundaries that you're using for this interaction, um, but it's really then about how you can start to engage with the language model. So I think a lot of people will look at it um, and look at the response and to say whether or not it's useful. It's kind of a binary decision that they make. Is it good or is it bad? Um, what we actually should be doing is thinking of that as kind of the first step in, in, a, in an ongoing conversation. So it's, it's actually really, really good if you can look at that response and say to the language model, oh, that's not really what I was looking for. I need it to be a little bit more formal or I want you to give me the response in academic language. Um, but maybe not so much jargon or take all the jargon that you've just given it given to me and uh, rewrite it um, so that I can understand it because I'm a novice. Uh, so that iterative um, um, conversation is really important. And then um, the kinds of structured prompting that we can give language models mean and the complexity of those prompts means that they can start to approximate agents and the the difference between a language model and an agent is that the agent is kind of a collection of models where you have one kind of master model and that model is able to hand off tasks to other um, smaller models that are um, fine tuned to achieve certain tasks. So rather than learning how to prompt models, we will become um, uh, almost like project managers and hand off complex pieces of work to agents and those agents will then break down those tasks or break down those uh, large projects into a series of tasks and then use those tasks to generate prompts that they give to other language models. And we're already seeing um, the start of this kind of thing with um, code um, code completion agents. Um, and one of the most popular ones is called Devon, um, if you want to look at uh, that piece of work. Um, the advice that I give most people is to treat generative AI like an expert and to think of it like a person. Um, so we're starting to see that generative models have expertise within and across professional domains. So you may uh, be an expert in a certain domain, but your and your expertise may be very deep, but it's going to be very narrow. And the more time you spend in higher education and research, you kind of increase that that focus. Um, and so your domain of expertise becomes increasingly narrow, but increasingly deep. What we're seeing is that generative AI is it started out with kind of superficial expertise across most professional domains, but it was very kind of um, shallow. And what we're seeing is that every every day um, these models are just increasing in the depth of their expertise across all of those professional domains. So we can see this in things like um, GPT-4 being able to pass the New York um, uh, licensing exam. Uh, it has already passed in the 90th percentile the um, United States uh, medical licensing exam. Um, and so 
that I think there's a list somewhere where you can see all of the kind of high level regulatory body examinations that GPT-4 has passed. And almost all of them are in the 80th and 90th percentile, which means that they're performing better than 80 to 90 percent of the people who take those exams. So we're really seeing this deep expertise developing um, very, very quickly. They are language models, and so it makes sense that they are expert communicators. Um, and so we can ask them to explain concepts to us in very, very, very diverse ways. Uh, you can, um, one of the examples that I had a colleague show me was to explain mathematical concepts for the UK GCSE, GCSE exams, uh, using the metaphor of Formula One racing, because his son um, was a big fan of Formula One racing, um, but was struggling with mathematical concepts. And so he was getting language models to explain those concepts to him using um, the analogy or the metaphor of Formula One racing. Um, you can say, take these, um, take these five papers um, of this really advanced topic that's right at the edge of my expertise and explain it to me as if I was a 10 year old. And then once you wrap your head around that explanation, say, OK, now explain it to me as if I was a first year university student. Now explain it to me as you would to an expert. And it's able to take you progressively through those different explanations, those different levels of explanations. So that communication skill is, I think, an underappreciated um, uh, feature of language models. A lot of people are still concerned about the accuracy of answers, and I say that the way around that is to not ask it for answers, but for ideas. They're really, really creative. And if you think that creativity is this special human thing, um, then you haven't really been playing around with language models at all. Um, all that creativity is, is the ability to make novel connections between uh, seemingly unrelated uh, concepts. And I mean, people who are kind of experts in creativity will say this all the time. Um, all that creativity is, is that abil ability to connect um, ideas across domains. Language models are able to do that um, way better than, than human beings. Um, when you start treating them like, like human beings, like people, you start to evaluate its responses differently. So we don't think that any person um, is able to give us a response that's 100% accurate. We assume that every, every response that someone gives us is taking place on a spectrum, and we assume some level of error, and we adjust our expectations accordingly. And so we don't ask someone a question and expect them to give us a response like a computer would um, with that level of accuracy. And so when we look at language models, we can start to calibrate our expectations in a different way if we think of them as people. I know that they're not, um, but it helps to, to change the way that we think. Um, and when we start interacting with language models in a collaborative engagement, we start to realize that we are both responsible for weak outputs. So when I get a bad response from the language model, it's not that it isn't very good. It's that we haven't yet figured out a way to work effectively together. And so the more time you spend with language models, the more effective you become at using them to increase the, um, the, the accuracy and the relevance um, and the strength of the outputs that you're getting from the language models. So now I'm going to shift um, a little bit and start talking about some specific use cases in the research context. Um, we know that the research process relies heavily on this idea of data provenance. So we can take the conclusions of our research. We need to be able to map that conclusion back through the data, through the interpretation, through the data collection and analysis, through the, the instruments, the, through the design, all the way back to the initial problem, question and aim. And that's that data provenance, that, that link that we look for um, across the whole of the research project. Um, so now we've already said that language models don't do that data provenance very well. They are getting much better um, every day. But not all of the research tasks rely on that very kind of strong link um, from one thing to another. So I'm going to give some examples of isolated things. We're not able to yet give language models a research problem and then ask it to build a um, uh, to actually do the research. But um, I, just as an example, yesterday I put together a research proposal um, from scratch uh, in about two hours. Um, it was about 10 pages of work um, and I did almost every part of it with um, with Claude. Uh, Claude 3 is a language model from Anthropic. And I basically started off with a prompt where I described everything that this project needs to do, um, uh, the, the problem I wanted to address, the aim, the kind of design I wanted it to use. Uh, it gave me an outline and then I worked with it, iterating through that outline to prepare um, the full research uh, proposal. Um, and now that's become the first draft that I've shared with the rest of the research team. Something that would have taken me two or three days in the past um, took me about two hours. 
we can have a conversation later if you think that that's unethical. Um, well, I, I think it's not, but you know, some people have different ideas. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about some of these examples. So these are all prompts that I've used for projects that I've been busy with over the last couple of months. Um, your mileage may vary. Um, I've also simplified these prompts. Usually my prompts run on to a couple of hundred words, um, sometimes you know, up to a thousand, sometimes many thousands when I'm attaching documents that might be 20 to 30 pages long. So depending on your specific use case, um, you, you might uh, you, you have to experiment is what I'm trying to say. Um, so in this example, I needed to put together a CBD activity that was evidence based for some of our external partners in the local NHS trusts. So um, it was going to be about the key features approach to developing clinical reasoning. Uh, we don't need to get into the details of that. I'm familiar enough with the, with the topic that I felt confident in my ability to judge the responses from Claude. Um, I went to uh, Google Scholar. I just downloaded the four articles with the highest citation counts for um, the for the keywords, key features approaching clinical reasoning. Um, I just looked at the titles, made sure that they were kind of in the ballpark of what I was looking at, uploaded them to uh, Claude, said, tell me why this approach has merit, why it might be useful for me. I wanted to use that as a kind of a um, an executive summary for the clinicians who are going to be looking at this. I asked for five key takeaways, a set of principles for incorporating the concept into assessment tasks because that needed to be included in the um, the CPD activity. And I've just taken the first line from each of the responses or the first line from each response to the questions that I gave it. Um, this was a, a really, really uh, quick way to to build out the CPD activity. Um, and then uh, I think there's an example a little, a little bit later for a, um, a and an additional component that I asked for. Um, an idea generator. Um, it's really difficult to come up with um, ideas for uh, PhDs, especially when you're not working at the cutting edge. So you tend to have to spend an enormous amount of time reading um, what's happening in the cutting edge for you to make a decision about what kind of question you might be interested in, in exploring. So this was just something that I um, you know, took off the top of my head. Um, all of the questions that it suggested are, you know, really, really good questions. If you're doing a PhD and you're interested in this topic, generative AI and scholarly practice, you know, it, it gave me, I think, what are there, four, um, four suggestions here. Um, one of the things that's worth noting is that it's as easy for it to generate 20 questions as it is to generate five. So, um, you know, uh, I was saying earlier, like we, we think that humans are really creative. When you start pushing language models like that, um, you know, don't ask for three responses, ask for 100 and it will give you 100. Um, now you can go through that and you can throw away 80 of them because, you know, you decide that they're not very good. 20 of them are going to be really good and five of them are going to be phenomenal and way better than you would have been able to come up on your own. So this idea of using language models to push the boundaries of creativity, um, to find gaps, uh, to find personal interests, I think this is a really useful um, area. Summarization is just phenomenal. Um, I use this multiple times every single day. Um, so I uh, upload uh, articles, reports, um, and I just say summarize. Summarize this thing. Um, you can say summarize it in a thousand words, five thousand words. Summarize it and pull out these features. Um, where in the document do they talk about this? Um, and so it's very rare that I sit down and open a document and start reading from the beginning. Um, um, I I basically just bounce around. I ask for a summary. I pick three or four things from that summary that I think are useful, and then I start having a conversation with the with the document through the language model. Um, I've mentioned this idea of explaining something to me as if I was a novice. Um, summarize meeting transcripts. So if you have meetings with your with your team, with your uh, with your supervisor, with your students, um, just pull out those transcripts um, and just say summarize these. Include that in your notes. Um, it's really, really good for video transcripts. Um, and you can say, I, I use this all the time with Teams because my university doesn't pay for the 365 integration with Copilot, but I still get the transcript. So I get the transcript and then I say, you know, what time did blah, blah, blah say this? What did they, when did they discuss? Who said what? Um, so it's really, really useful. Um, again, don't think of it as this kind of once off interaction. Think of it as a conversation that you're having with the, the language model. Um, 
This is a, a little piece of work that I did with a team that we are working on um, for, uh, we, we're doing a focus symposium and workshop at IFOM in a couple of months. Um, and so we want to develop a survey for workshop participants. Um, so I basically took an initial set of responses that people had given us, uploaded them um, to Claude, uh, had it generate a um, uh, like a framework um, where I said, you know, from all of these responses from these participants, tell me all the things that were top of mind um, in these questions. And then from this, build a survey that we can use pre and post workshop that we want to run. Um, I gave it the outcomes. I made it clear that I wanted to do kind of a comparative analysis. So only give me questions that would allow me to do that. Uh, include a range of different question types. That was just experimental. I wanted to see what kinds of questions it included in the survey. It gave us about 15 questions, and now we can use that as the, the beginning of our um, kind of planning. Um, this also is a little bit controversial. Um, well, I don't think it's controversial, but uh, but some people do. Um, uh, Dawn mentioned earlier um, about submitting an article and the uh, the journal wanting to uh, for you for you to disclose whether or not you've used generative AI. The first example I've seen of an editorial board was the New England Journal of Medicine um, AI um, uh, version of that journal. They encourage authors to use generative AI in their writing, and the reason that they give is that it levels the playing field. So reviewers tend to place uh, unconsciously, they tend to place a lot of value on your ability to articulate your ideas using good English. Um, weirdly, not everyone in, in the world speaks good English. And so um, the uh, the editor, the editorial board say that what they care about is scientific ideas. And so um, if you can, uh, if you can use generative AI to articulate your ideas better, then science improves. Um, and that should be the goal, not how well you can write. So um, I think that's a, a really useful way of thinking about things. And I think about that a, a lot when it comes to assessment. We can talk about that um, at the end if anyone has any questions. Um, so I had uh, I was working on a book chapter with a colleague. Um, each of us had uh, been working on uh, for some obscure reason. We had this we had two different versions of the chapter that we were going to submit. Um, we wanted to um, collate those two um, uh, those two chapters, but we also had a separate document, about 15 pages of notes of concepts that we wanted to include in the book chapter. And you know, you, it was all kind of messy and and very um, kind of ad hoc and all over the place, very haphazard. And we wanted to kind of align these three documents, where we had the one version of the book chapter that included all the relevant concepts from the notes and from these two drafts that we had been working on. I explained what the book was going to be about. Um, there were specific definitions of this concept of compassion. Um, I really wanted it to make sure that it used that definition, not to come up with its own definition. So I specified I wanted it to pay attention to that definition. Um, analyze the documents, take the high level ideas as a framework for a draft that I want you to write. Um, we were also writing this for a non-academic audience. So I said, I want you to use an academic um, you, so you're an academic writer, but I want you to avoid stuffy jargon filled writing. And that's the exact prompt that I used. And generative AI knows what that means. Um, and so it wrote this in a really accessible way, but it was still kind of more slightly formal in how it was structured. And I just said, I want you to begin by laying out the aim of the chapter and blah, blah, blah. Um, and basically it, it took all of those documents. And so it would take chapter this uh, paragraph two from the one document, which aligned with paragraph seven in the other document, merge those two paragraphs and then compress them so that there wasn't any re repetition or duplication. And then that gave us a starting point where we could now start working on this new piece of uh, this new draft um, and move forward with that. I've never done this personally, but I've got no doubt that this is the way forward. Um, so for grant writing, a lot of grant writing is formulaic and box ticking. Um, so funding bodies usually have very specific frameworks and outlines that they want you to adhere to. So they give you a set of guidelines and a template that you use to fill out that document. Um, you can actually upload those guidelines now. You can take a narrative description of the project that you want to do. So you just write out everything that you want to do um, using kind of your just normal language. So you get together with your, your team, you write out what you want to do, and then you upload both of those documents to the funding body's uh, proposal guidelines. And you say, take the work that you've already done and just format it according to the requirements of the, the funding body. Um, you can also upload past successful applications if you have access to those. 
um, you can upload successful applications that are not related to this funding body, um, but which are nonetheless you think you know well described. Um, so you can say take the take the tone and the language of this other successful grant application, but replace it with all the content of this new application, and it's able to do all of that sort of thing. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't attend this workshop, but I just pulled out some of the kind of marketing uh, around it. I thought this is a really interesting approach. Um, I've got no doubt that in the future, all grant writing applications will be done with AI and uh, funding bodies will be using AI to evaluate the, at least the first round of those grant writing, those grant applications. So we'll have this weird thing where we're using AI to generate work that is then being evaluated by AI. I mean, it, this is already happening in journals now. So the bigger journals are already using AI to help editors um, make sense of the avalanche of uh, applications, not applications, submissions that they're getting. Um, this is kind of still a little bit controversial. I know that the supervisors in the room are kind of, you know, having a massive intake of breath now. Um, I think that the data analysis component is not quite ready yet for a first round. I wouldn't use generative AI to do my data analysis, but just as an experiment, I took a transcript of a focus group discussion to uh, generative AI, I uploaded it, it was anonymized. Um, just also the terms of service of most of these companies allow you to make sure that what you upload isn't built into the training data. So that's, I know that that's something a lot of people worry about, but it's not real. Um, the terms of service do prevent them from uh, taking what you've uploaded and incorporating it into the training data. I think with ChatGPT, there's a little toggle that you have to switch in the settings. Um, by default, it's on, but you can switch it off. Claude um, doesn't collect any of that data and include it in their, their training runs. Anyway, um, so you can upload that documentation. I still would make sure that it's um, anonymized. If your institution has um, uh, Copilot, uh, if you've got an institutional license to Microsoft for their Copilot language model, uh, you can do this um, in a way that none of your data leaves the premises, so it all just sits on your institutional servers. You don't need to worry about it going back to anyone else. Anyway, so I took this transcript, uploaded it to Claude, um, and I just said analyze. Um, so I think the, the original prompt was a, a little bit more detailed, um, so I think I might have asked her for a thematic analysis or, or something like that. Now, you can get even more specific and you can say, I want you to do an analysis in the style of, and then you can upload a, a PDF, an article, and say, I want you to do the analysis that's described in this framework in the article that I've just given you. Um, and in that case, I've got no doubt that it will be a really, 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 really good analysis. Now, we need to decide as a community whether or not we want our PhD students not doing the analysis. Um, if you think that that's a controversial question, then bear in mind that Envivo and Atlas TI are already building this into the next versions of their software. And so I would suggest that it's not going to be that much longer that we are going to um, be asking students to do, or even researchers to do any kind of data analysis. We use SPSS to do the more complex mathematical or statistical um, analysis for um, for um, quantitative data. We've never had software that's been that's allowed us to do the qualitative data analysis. That's going to go away very very soon. Um, so you know that's also something that we can talk about. Um, for me, I, it's it's not an issue. Um, I think for uh, this kind of come back comes back to what I was saying earlier. We have to ask ourselves. What matters in the future? Um, outside of universities, no one cares. No one cares how you solve the problem. All they cared about was that you solved the problem. When someone solves cancer, nobody's going to say, how did you do it? How did you do the analysis? How can we be sure? Um, the only thing that matters is that you solved cancer. Um, and I think that we are shifting in that direction. Um, and again, we can. Uh, that might be a controversial claim. I don't think it is. Um, but we can talk about what that means. So in summary, um, language models are next word predictors. They can generate multimodal content. Content. They're improving in competence every single day. They have uh, give us access to expertise, creative ideation through natural language, which we've never had in the past. Um, though we acknowledge that there are biases and limitations. I think that there's a wide case, a wide range of use cases across all aspects of research. There are still some ethical uh, implications. Um, but I think that those relate largely around to a, um, a paradigm that is uh, rapidly getting old. Um, I think we still need to evaluate outputs critically. 
And I say for now because I think in six months' time, we are going to trust these outputs uh, more than we trust uh, things like Google Maps. Um, so, yeah, um, that's my that's you know that's my pitch. Um, and and now hopefully we can uh, there's time for a few questions. Thank you very much, Michael. I think you've given us so much to think about and so much to explore. Um, so I see there's already a, a question, but there will now be opportunity for questions. Rensha, you, you've, you had your hand up first. You can go ahead. Hi, morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for that. I think that was uh, very insightful and thought provoking. Um, uh, after we, we attended um, a program this week and yesterday was, um, there was a section about AI and um, I decided to play around with it. Uh, so I used ChatGPT and um, I actually coincidentally um, asked it to help me with grant writing. So I didn't you know, use any guidelines or anything and um, it gave me like all these different sections and it obviously helped me sort about, you know, different ideas of how to sort of position certain things. But then I asked it to um, provide reference for certain sections. So um, uh, can you help me with, you know, substantiating these um, things that you've provided? And it said, because I'm not, um, uh, what was the word? But it couldn't provide the references. So um, uh, I just wanted to maybe hear some input from your side on that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's, you know, a common concern that people say it doesn't provide the references. So, um, so I, there's a couple of different facets to that. I mean, I, the first thing I want to say is that two years ago these technologies didn't exist, and like we, we're complaining about the fact that it can't it can't do the work that a human being um, is able to do, and yet you know the amount of progress that we've seen in in all this time is is phenomenal. Um, I, I would use something called perplexity. So there's another language model called perplexity. If you search for perplexity.ai. Um, they, from the beginning, have used this approach called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, and they do provide citations for all of the outputs. So it's a very, very, very good language model. Um, it's kind of used a lot in the in the academic community um, for that reason. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I, again, I, I think that this problem is going to go away very, very soon. Um, on Monday, uh, OpenAI, uh, part of their announcement was that their GPT-4 model would be available for for everyone for free. Um, and I mean, GPT-4 is an uh, order of magnitude better than GPT-3.5, which up until now is what most people have been using on the free version. Um, and so you're going to have access to GPT-4 for free. It's going to be connected to the internet, so it will be able to go away and find those resources that you're looking for. But Perplexity does that today. Um, so, you know, uh, personally, I still use my own references because I I like to find my own references. Um, uh, but I don't think that that's going to be an issue moving forward. I just see there's a question about using the pay, paid version of Claude. Uh, as of about two or three weeks ago, I did use the paid version. Um, and I, I do this kind of thing in some of my talks where I talk about intelligence on demand. And that's exactly what this is. Um, I don't pay for these language models at all except I have a very, very, very busy month um, and I have an enormous amount of content that I need to get through as part of that. We just had a, a whole bunch of work that needed to be done and I didn't want to hit the um, uh, the limits of the free version of Claude. Um, so I paid for it for a month because I just don't want to have to care about, um, you know, hitting that limit. So now I just have it running all the time and I just use it for everything. But at the end of this month, I've already canceled my, my subscription. Um, so it'll get to the end of this month when my workload dies down a little bit, and then I'll, I'll just keep using the, the free version. All of the examples that I've given you bar one today um, were on the free version of Claude, um, not the paid version. Thank you. And then Marlette uh, also has a question. Yes, good morning, Michael and colleagues. Um, as you know, we're sitting in a lot of meetings where we need to take minutes. So I was wondering if you use a recording of these meetings and ask AI to generate the minutes. Uh, however, my question is regarding the 
who sometimes we discuss very sensitive issues. What happens to this information? And it's it, it's yeah, you know, is it safe? Is it really safe because some of these things are really private? And um, yeah. yeah, so that is my question regarding minutes. Um, right. Minute so uh, that's a great question. Um, transcription is built into Teams already, so I'm pretty sure that your recordings all automatically get transcribed. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I do now is I download the transcript, which you get in a Word document. I save the Word document as a PDF. Then I view the PDF in a browser, um, and then Copilot is built into Edge. Uh, so I don't know about your university, you're a Microsoft university, so, so are we. Um, we have an institutional license for Copilot, which is a GPT-4 level um, language model. So uh, Copilot is built into Edge, view the PDF in, um, in Edge browser, and then ask Copilot for a summary, and you can have that conversation with that. And the benefit of that is that all of that interaction, the PDF, the prompts, the responses, all of that sits on university servers, and none of that goes to Microsoft. Um, so it's it's completely secure. You should actually have a little tick box, a little green tick in the top of your um, Copilot window that just says that this is protected. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. It's good to know. Thank you. That's also a, a lovely idea, Marley, to uh, to have the minutes quicker, hey? Um, and Michael seems to to be, uh, you know, you can just give the solution about appropriate uh, Gen A to to use. So, Michael, I think we might need to do a practical session with you as well. But I see. I'll, I'll just do, just the comments on that. Uh -huh. um, I I use this for everything. There is nothing that I don't integrate yeah. generative AI for anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about that, but I'm going to hand over to Prof. Hanakom first. Hi, Michael. Thank you for, for sharing some of your ideas. I, I am aligned with what you're thinking. My question is just um, around the role of universities going forward. And I know there's, you know, I mean, this uh, has prompted us to start thinking about, you know, what are the what are the outcomes that we are actually trying to um, facilitate specifically at higher order and PhD students um, because it almost seems as if you can if you if you write the right correct prompt you actually don't need you know the the, the traditional skills if I can put it like that for a PhD student so I was just wondering if you have any thoughts around that thanks uh, I've got lots of thoughts around that <laughs> and they're not very comforting for academics and universities unfortunately exactly um, um, OK, so in the immediate term, um, I think that universities need to shift the uh, idea of PhD and, and postgraduate programs completely. Um, so w when you start using these language models, um, uh, let me go back a little bit. Um, there's a there's a professor of business at the, the Wharton School of Business in the US. He says that if you haven't had three sleepless nights filled with existential dread about the implications of generative AI on uh, you, the work that you do, then you haven't really understood it. Um, and, and I really do think that that's true. Um, if you think that this is just a, just a tool, this is just something like Word that we're going to integrate into business as usual, um, I, I think that you've missed the point. Um, and that, that's not because like there's anything wrong with you. It's that we've never before had to deal with something that has this level of implication for um, the work that we do, for society, actually. Um, so I think that this is massive in a way that like nothing that has come before um, has been uh, this important, uh, in my opinion. So moving forward, uh, I think that postgraduate research needs to shift entirely um, away from things like proposals and protocols and um, the kinds of problems that we traditionally look at, um, I think all that matters moving forward is actually solving problems in the world. Um, and so I had a question. Interestingly, I, I actually gave the same talk to the um, to the medical school at Stellenbosch University on Tuesday. Um, and one of the questions was around research proposals. Um, and how do we make sure that students aren't using generative AI to produce their research proposals? And basically, I said, why do you care? Like we generating research proposals now is so easy and so trivial that anybody can do it. Like it used to be this really specialized skill. Now, like 
a child can generate research proposals. So we need to shift our expectations massively away from the generation of the proposal. I'm now trying to make the argument in my institution at the undergraduate level that if language models are giving us kind of superhuman capabilities across all knowledge domains, we can no longer expect our students to write essays or to complete MCQs. We have to change the baseline expectations so that we massively increase what normal looks like. So for me, I want to see my undergraduate students actually implementing um, health promotion programs and then directly measuring the impact of those programs in their communities. I'm not interested in them writing a proposal about what a health promotion campaign should look like. They actually have to implement it and then demonstrate the effectiveness of that. So let's take childhood obesity. That's a big problem in some areas that, that I'm working in. I want my undergraduate students to implement health promotion campaigns that demonstrably reduce that problem um, in that community. So they should be building apps, they should be building businesses, they should be building interactive websites. They should actually be doing things in the real world and using AI in any way that we want. Um, not everyone agrees with me, most people don't. Um, but that's for me, that is the only way forward. I, I don't see I don't see how we can move forward because we cannot reliably detect the use of AI um, by students. So we either have to assume that they're all cheating or we just have to make it normal that everybody uses AI for everything all the time. Because that, I, I don't see a future where that isn't the case. Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question, um, Prof. Anikov. No, it does. I mean, it, I, I don't think it's a conversation that we can have here. I just think that we need to start thinking, because I agree with you in terms of this is part of our lives. It's almost like the invention of the wheel or fire. It's going to be existential in terms of disruption. Um, yeah, in we're, the way we're we already seeing... Forward. We're already seeing businesses that invest in generative AI models to support their um, uh, employees' productivity. Um, they're increasing their investments in generative AI over time and their productivity goes up, profits go up. Um, throughout every other sector, people are embracing this and showing improvements in outcomes that they care about. Uh, higher education can't be any different. Um, we need to embrace this 100% uh, for everything all the time. Um, in my opinion. Thanks. We can continue this discussion. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, I th I think that's a very relevant and very needed um, discussion to have, and and how we should adapt and and change, um, and also to prepare us for for that change. Uh, Adno, you are next. Uh, Prof. Um, Unger is having a big conversation here in the chat. Prof Unger, I'll give you an opportunity after after Adna has spoken. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you again. Um, oh, no. The the I completely agree with what what was said earlier on, and I've took bits and pieces of um, um, uh, what we what we what we just said, um, and I think some of our questions were related to grant writing and. Um, postgraduate students and Marlet was speaking about uh, minutes and et cetera, et cetera. I maybe would like to share a little bit, but also uh, my experience with, because I haven't used it much, I happened to use, I think it was called Po, um, and, I, and I had a limited time where I had to do a teaching session with the second years to catch up on some work that they've done. And I want to my comment is basically linked to the creativity. Um, so I gave it a prompt in terms of I've got so many oh, so many hours and these are the, the ideas or the topics or the outcomes that I would like to use. And it gave me an, a framework when, uh, for how to plan my session. Um, and then obviously I used the outcomes to bring it back after the summary. It also gave me a summary, you know, summarize something and these are the things that you must check whether the students understood. Um, I hope, I hope the students will be able to use um, false risk outcome measures a little bit more. 
uh, on the clinical platform next year. Um, but it, it will be surprising how engaged they were. Um, it was a, I think I had a four hour slot for this catch up. Um, and most of the time they were engaged and the things that came back from them. And it, it's, I think for me, it, it linked back to what you said about creativity. Um, uh, 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 in simple language, guiding. Um, so the creative idea was the, it was created for me and then I went further and I used my uh, my brain and I, uh, uh, you know, slotted things in. So, yeah, I think I've, I've also listened to a, a previous seminar on the use of AI and I agree with um, your thoughts and what Susan also said and what Marianne spoke about here in the in the in the chat that we must normalize it. I think if we normalize it, we may end up with the students not using it because we we saying that they must try and use it but <laughs> as they do. Um, but yeah, it it can be a very great it can it can be of great help. It saved me some so much time. Um, yeah. Uh, just in my experience with teaching, I use it uh, also where uh, I had a group of students that were really disengaged, very passive. And for every lecture, I was going back and saying, like, I'm, I'm trying these things. Uh, it's not working. Students are very passive. Give me some more ideas about how I could um, engage them more effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, the students remained disengaged. Um, so, But the language model was giving me ideas that I hadn't thought of. Um, yeah. So I really found it useful. Um, for that, yeah, um, and that idea of normalizing it, I think, is important, but not without, in parallel, yeah, also changing our expectations for yeah. assessments. Um, I think that that's really important. If we're going to carry on giving them the same assessments that we've been giving them for the last five hundred years, um, and let's be honest, we haven't changed anything really. Um, I think that we need to uh, massively shift our expectations for what those assessments need to look like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael, do you still have a minute or two? Yeah. OK, Prof uh, Marianne, do you want to add anything? <laughs> I, I also yeah. have a yeah. question or two, <laughs> but I'll give you yeah. opportunity to add. Yeah. No, uh, uh, thanks, Michael. In the chat, I'm not sure whether you've read it yet. You know, it, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that in today's day and age, never mind AI, just the, the digital competence, um, is so starkingly absent from our professional competency frameworks. And, you know, and it sort of begins begins there, um, if, you know. But it, so that's the one thing I wanted to say. The other, what's really difficult for me, I mean, I love it. It has saved me an enormous amount of time. But when the pressure is on and you need to deliver something and you struggle, I mean, I'm a novice and I really struggle to prompt correctly, <laughs> then uh, together with limited, you know, when you upload documents that they need to include in their thinking about providing me with a solution, and maybe that's a mistake I'm making. It actually has that information. I don't need to give it the information. Um, yeah, so I'm still struggling with that. So sometimes I'll say, okay, let me just go back to the old way of doing it because I'm a little bit more confident there, you know. So the yeah. uptake, as much as I love it, I find I'm doing it more just for personal and selfish <laughs> reasons rather than, yeah. So again, um, if it becomes more um, normal, more acceptable, um, and we actually, because I think it's fantastic if students use it, uh, because it helps them to think. But we have to, our job is to check that they are actually thinking and they do actually understand what it's offering, because otherwise it's also useless. You know, then we start getting zombies. Um, Agreed. I know a lot, but actually don't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, thanks. Uh, I think, Good to see you. Um, I think that idea of um, uh, <laughs> What you said about uh, prompting and getting comfortable with uh, with the technology, I think that it takes about 10 hours um, from what I've seen, uh, 10 hours of use to feel like you have a good sense of uh, of the eccentricities of the models. They do have personalities and um, not like a human personality. I know that they don't really, um, but they all respond in slightly eccentric ways. Um, 
uh, one of the things that I did the other day uh, was that we, we had to put together f a funding proposal presentation for the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists. And I took their quality assurance framework and their standards uh, framework and asked language model to develop a, an outline of that and then to map our vision for the future of physiotherapy education. That was just what the project was called and we had to submit the application. So we had a vision and then I wanted to do a mapping exercise where I took that vision and then looked at the quality assurance framework. And basically the prompt that I gave it was quite complex. It ran on to several hundred words, but it was, you know, these are the documents that I've attached. This is what each document is. This is what it describes. I want you to review the document and make sure that you understand it. Then I want you to, and I just took it through this step, a series of steps that I would have had to do, um, but I just told it to do those exact same steps. And so I would say, take the outcome of step one and feed that into step two. Take the outcome of step two and then make sure that you include that in step three. And so it's almost like giving a research assistant a very clear set of um, guidelines around how you want them to complete this piece of work. And it did everything 100%. It took me a long time to build the prompt because I had to think very carefully and clearly about what it is that I wanted it to do. But once I said go, oh, and then you can also say, nobody does this, but you can also say, ask me clarifying questions if there are any pieces of information you feel are important in order for you to move forward. And when you do that, it will often come back to you and say, here are three questions that will help me in giving you a better response. And so again, treating it like an assistant where you kind of make yourself available to provide support for it in order for it to achieve the outcomes that you want it to do. Marianne, you were muted there, but we saw the thumbs up. <laughs> uh, and we have a hand from Eugene. Eugene, you may go ahead. <coughs> Yeah, good morning, everybody. <laughs> and uh, Michael, I'm very happy to see you again. <laughs> uh, good to see you too. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And doing very well at Stanford University. <laughs> okay, um, I, I want to comment about the use of the this language model. I remember when they come in, uh, people are still concerned about the students. They are saying that is going to take their their, their their level of a clinical, I mean, of a critical thinking and all those kind of things. But one thing I think I've realized that uh, this language model is what you give, you give in, that's what you get in, out. So you give the rubbish in, the rubbish out. So I think what we should do as a lecturer or academic, academician, we should still work with this language model, but still guide the students about how do we use them how do we use our critical thinking to use? Because you need to think, is it really this at the level of what you want to be? So if that's the law of you as a lecturer, right? I'm just talking about now undergraduate part of it, not the PhD level. So you need really to give the students the guidelines that, okay, you're right, this is what the outcomes I want, but then you use the IR, I mean, whatever the language model to help you to generate those ideas. That is my comment, I think. So it's a matter yeah. of knowing how to interact with them. I I tell my students to use it to replace me. And that's an uncomfortable thought for a lot of people. But I, I say to them, the kinds of questions that you would normally ask me, those are the kinds of questions that you should be asking language models. So you wouldn't ask me to write your essay. So don't ask a language model to write your essay. But you would ask me to give you feedback on a piece of writing. Now, language models are phenomenally good at giving feedback on writing. And so, like I give language models my pieces of my work all the time. I say, tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me what assumptions I've built into this. Tell me where my bias is showing through. Tell me where the argument is weak. Um, and so I upload pieces of my work all the time and ask it to give me feedback. And then I ask my students to do the same thing. So why should they get one round of feedback from me where I'm rushed and I'm not able to give them as deep a level of feedback as they might need when they can submit to a language model three, four, five times, a hundred times, get feedback, and then to submit their piece of work to me for, um, for assessment. Um, so I think all the kinds of questions that they are comfortable coming to me for 
those are the kinds of questions that I want them to be asking language models because the language models are available for free 24 seven. You can use them as much as you want. They have infinite patience. They never get bored and tired or sleep. Um, we can really be effective in teaching students to use language models to support their learning way more effectively. That's true, yeah. Uh, I think we'll take one more question because I don't want to keep Michael for too long. I will rather make another appointment, uh, Michael, for, for in future. Like I say, I think I need to learn a little bit more about the practicalities, about asking the right questions to get the right responses. So, um, Marissa, you you are the one who's going to ask the, the last question. Over to you. Hi. Hi, Michael. It's lovely to see Hi, you Marissa. again. And you. as usual, uh, mind blown. <laughs> I really enjoy your sessions. Um, I actually have two questions. One is pretty silly, but do you like um, ask it please and say thank you? <laughs> because I've seen that happen. I do. And Oh, you do? OK, because I'm also quite polite and it's very, you know, um, nice in its response as well. Um, and then secondly, do you have a resource that teach the students how to prompt, um, you know, just getting them skilled in prompting? OK, so um, I think just to kind of caveat the first uh, point, I do say please, um, but that's because the original research that was coming out actually demonstrated that when you are polite to language models, they tend to give you better responses. That is less true now. I think you can be more abrupt. They've trained that out of the models. Um, but I still just out of habit, I say please a lot. Um, I do provide students with examples of prompts. Um, so, so there's a few different ways of thinking about this. Um, I, have a, I have an AI policy for my classroom where I actually provide students with a policy document that says in this classroom, in this module, this is how I encourage you to use AI. These are the models. This is where I want you to use it. This is how I want you to use it. These are the things I don't want you to use it for. So I'm very explicit in um, in terms of what I want my students to do. Um, the university kind of is tinkering on the edges of uh, some kind of a policy document, um, but I think it needs to be specific to each lecturer. Um, and so in that document, I do establish some of the boundaries and the context for students. Um, we also have a project in the university. Uh, we've got three working groups on AI, and one of those is operational. The other ones are technical and strategic. And the operational group, um, until recently, I was actually chairing, um, but then stepped back for, for other reasons. Um, the point of the operational group is to just experiment with a load of different prompts in all sorts of areas um, that students might be using them for. So a lot of non-academic prompting. So um, things around, uh, I don't know, simple things like, like you don't want to go out and exercise because it's raining. You normally go running. What are like 10 exercises that you can do in a two by two space because that's how big your bedroom is and using body weight as resistance. Like really, really kind of out there, non-academic prompts. Like how, how, how do I clean my apartment? I've never had to clean a place on my own. What are all the kind of uh, materials that I need to go shopping for in order to clean my apartment? So we're just experimenting with loads of different kinds of prompts, then testing those prompts with our university infrastructure and then trying to provide them at scale to students. Just saying, here are a load of ideas for ways that language models can uh, can help you. Um, but then also just teaching them the very basics so that a role goal instruct heuristic is very, very useful. Um, so providing them with specific examples of areas where they can use it in, especially around non-academic use cases, because students are actually really worried about being accused of cheating. And so we're trying to get them used to language models by using them in non-academic contexts where the question about plagiarism and cheating doesn't matter. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. No, it's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michael. As you as you can see, we we have a lot of questions. <laughs> I still also oh, have fine. a couple of questions, but um, time is is running out, and um, I think we've just we've just learned so much um, from you today, especially with regards to practical application, but also with regards to to just um, the principles of application, and also maybe thinking about where this is going to take us um, in future. And I think that is probably the most or the second most important thing. The other most important thing is how to use it effectively. Um, so I will definitely be in contact with you 
so that we can take this discussion um, forward in another time slot. But we we really enjoyed it. It was really engaging um, and it, it was just such a wealth of, of information. So thank you so much. And um, let us know when you are in Cape Town again, and then we can get a personal get together and, and have a glass. Of uh, I'll definitely do Cape that. Town um, wine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciated it. Yeah. Thanks so much. And there's lots of chats going on in the in the chat box and just saying thank you to you. So thanks so much and enjoy the day. Uh, it was a pleasure. Good to see everyone again. Keep well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Michael. Keep well. Bye.